You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and today we are going to be exploring the career and cinematic world of Yasudhiro Osu by looking at his four most acclaimed films. I was born, but late spring, Tokyo Story, and an autumn afternoon. Incredibly, these four films were made in four different decades. The 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And and span from 1932 to 1962. Not only that, I Was Born But is often considered the first essential osu and allows us to look at him and speak of him as a silent director. Meanwhile, an autumn afternoon was the very last film also made before succumbing to cancer on his 60th birthday. And it also lets us discuss Osu's late color period, which is just absolutely stunning. In a way, this lineup showcases Osu from his beginning until the very end, with the two most respected films of all in the middle. In particular, Tokyo Story, which in 2012 topped the Sight and Sounds director's list as the greatest film ever made. I know we won't be able to contain ourselves, uh, and that many other also films will be brought up along the way. I I already know Early Summer will be brought up, Good Morning uh, is coming in, and probably many others. As we trace the progression of Yasuo Iroso's cinematic language and explore his increasingly recognizable world. A world where the characters are usually as composed as the cinematography and framing. Polite nods and smiles hide secret longings, desire and pain. We will dive into that pain and everything that is left unsaid and explore just why his films affect us as much as they do. Uh, and that's probably a really good point to just bring in my absolutely brilliant co-hosts, Saul and Adam. And we can probably start with you, Adam, because I know that also is in your top echelon of directors. So what is it about Osu that makes you love his film so much? Well, I, th- I think the general style of his films, there's a lot of warmth, there's a lot of heart. One thing I like is that they don't show a lot of the main events, so they don't show weddings. They they sometimes don't even show the groom. There's a lot of things that aren't depicted that I feel like if you were watching an American film, they would kind of spoon feed everything to you. But I feel in the Oz- Aussie films, they don't depict a lot of stuff. There's a lot of it which is about interpretation. A lot of the films are very moving without having to use kind of easy tactics to move the audience. They are moving in a different way, in a more subtle way. Like there's so many powerful scenes where not that much happens and not that much is said, but you can read so much into it. And I think for me in general, that's preferable to watching a film where you know exactly what you're supposed to be thinking. You know exactly what all the characters are feeling. You know exactly what's going on all the time. So that that's the best I can I can sum it up for now. No, I, th- I think you're absolutely spot on there, Adam. I-, I think that the fact that he hides things from us, or he obscures things from us, that the fact that he leaves a lot of things to us, that we have to interpret the character motivations, that we have to kind of decipher what hides beneath the politeness, uh, and that there's so many things we don't even see. I think that makes his films much stronger because we engage with them in a different way from how we engage with other directors. And then you also have his unique style. It just got more and more concise in how the camera is allowed to move until it suddenly doesn't even move anymore. His framing, the frames within frames, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But I think this might be a good point to introduce our other co-host, Sol, who might, uh, shall we say, balance uh, the positivity coming from Adam and myself. Ozu was a director who I watched quite a few films from towards the beginning of my film journey, so... Going back around 15 years ago, you know, I saw the big classics, Tokyo Story, Late Spring, and a few of the others. And actually, in the lead up to this podcast, I hadn't rewatched any of them. So I got a bunch of these films that I'd seen for around 15 years. 
And in fact, there's actually only one new Ozu film that I'd actually seen uh, during the last 10 years. So I guess from my point of view as a director that I had some interest in to begin off with, but I suppose as my tastes have progressed and evolved, he's not quite a director that sort of does it for me to try and put it uh, mildly. So uh, what really what I like about his films is they are very well acted. Some of them do have some really nice compositions in there. So generally his films are technically well made. I haven't come across any that I've disliked. But just in terms of his filmmaking style and his signature pieces, like having characters stare at each other, or actually stare into the camera, looking directly into the camera rather than the eye lines matching up and very static camera work. That's just not quite what I'm looking for in films these days. So I guess stylistically is a director that doesn't interest me that much any longer, but it was definitely interesting going back and re-watching some of the films. And I guess also trying to find out why some of his films don't really particularly resonate with me. And I guess a lot of it also comes down to thematic stuff because a lot of his films are about family and the place of family and how that's evolving and changing. And a lot of it's not necessarily things that directly hit me as a viewer. So, yeah, I don't dislike his films, but it was definitely interesting as a more experienced film goer going in, sort of knowing that I saw these films and thought they were pretty good early in my film going journey. Will they still have the same impact to me now? And if they don't, well, why is that the case? So for me, that style that you're talking about, moving slightly away from and not being as interested in it anymore. I mean, I think that's the highlight for me with Osu. I think the fact that he created his own cinematic uh, language, which became increasingly restrained, increasingly composed, and, and it just feels so different from almost everything else out there. I think that's probably one of the big highlights uh, with his cinema. Uh, so it will be interesting to see, because I know you actually, like you said, you, you like uh, more or less all, all of his films, so it will be interesting to see how you balance the negative, positive, negative, and how you balance Adam and I's over-enthusiasm with your more, uh, more neutral uh, view, but that, that's probably going to be a big thing to get some balance in, in here as well, because not everyone will love every Osu Let's actually look into what you love then. What is your very favorite Ozu song? Technically speaking, my favorite Ozu film, or the one that I have the highest rating for, would be Tokyo Story, but it's a bit of a boring choice because it's the obvious choice. And also, it's a film that, predictably, because I was predicting it, did go down for me on rewatch. So. I don't quite hold in the same esteem that I did 15 years ago, but I wasn't expecting to either, so not really disappointing on that front. But I guess in terms of an Ozu film from way back 15 years ago that I haven't really watched since, that I have very positive memories of, I'm going to go out there and put a complete obscurity out there and say that What Did the Lady Forget is actually a pretty great film from memory. I wow. actually like it. Yeah, I actually like it when Ozu does comedy, which we'll get to a little bit on later on with I Was Born But and Good Morning. And yeah, I just remember being really amused by it and finding it you know, surprisingly well done for a Lily Korea film. So uh, that's my more obscure pick to put out there. What about you, Adam? Is Tokyo Story the one that you find to be the greatest Ozu? Or do you have another film which you think is really high up there? Well, the reason that Ozu was one of my favorite directors in the first place was late spring. Uh, I think Tokyo Story must have been the first film I saw a long time ago, and I liked it at the time. But then late spring was the one that changed everything from me liking Ozu to, to thinking he was pretty amazing. And I mean, what happened basically, I rewatched Tokyo Story and late spring um, a few days ago. And actually rewatching them, I kind of felt like Tokyo Story was probably the better film overall. But Late Spring would be my personal favourite. And a huge part of that is based on the ending, based on the final scene. I think the final scene with the dad is probably my favourite moment in any Ozu film. And yeah, I think you touched upon something earlier on when you mentioned family and that being one of the most important parts of the films and how that maybe doesn't resonate with you. And I would say the family element is probably why 
it resonates so much with me all his films not maybe not all of his films but the general idea of his films i think family is such a strong part particularly in the the last few films i think late spring i think Noriko, you know, we, we can maybe talk later about the Noriko trilogy, but I think Noriko in Late Spring and Noriko's dad, I think they just play the parts incredibly well. And I think the whole film is very moving. And there's a lot of culture that's incredibly important in the films as well, in terms of arranged marriages, forced marriages. And now I'm just rambling on, so I'll stop. I, mean, I wouldn't say that. I think that the, the cultural critique, if you will, that also puts into his films, where you have these kind of oppressive societal structure that end up hurting the characters. Um, it, it's really interesting. I don't think also, also never really makes a specific statement for or against something, but he shows us things in a way that makes us rethink them. And, and that's also a really powerful uh, part of his films. Uh, I love that you picked uh, What Did the Lady Forget, uh, Saul. That's, that was always one of the lesser Osus uh, for me, and I'm not that big on Osu when he did comedy in the early days. Uh, though I would actually say, if you're talking about my favorite Osus, I would probably go with uh, The End of Summer. And ironically, that is one of his funniest uh, films as well, where you have this kind of gallivanting father who's uh, still shacking up with his uh, mistress. You have uh, a lot of playfulness. Uh, a lot of uh, cheeky selfishness involved. And I think there's a big difference when also goes into the polar stage of his career because there was always this element of critique and from early summer onwards there's also this comedy element when people try to arrange marriages and kind of sneak around behind people's back. But once we get into the later films, so late autumn, the end of summer and uh, and even an autumn afternoon, those kind of edges are, are a little bit not necessarily dirtier or unclean, as I, as I think Enrico tells uh, her father's friends back in the late spring already. But it's a little bit more comical. The, the facade is dropping off a little bit, uh, and that opens up for a lot of moments of comedy. Though Tokyo Story and Late Spring are also up there, so it's a bit of a three-way tie for me. Um, b- before we start just jumping straight into uh, the films th- themselves... Where would you say is the best place to start with Osu if they're listening to this now and you've never seen an Osu? Like, what would be the best place for them to start? I think probably starting with Tokyo Story in some ways makes the most sense. I think certainly starting with one of the last 10 or so films. I would say the early films, the silent ones, are something that you would explore once you've already seen some of the more, the bigger classics. But I think Tokyo Story is a bit more accessible and yeah i think that'd be a good place you like that one you then explore the rest of the ones from that era and then you explore forever back to the to the silent ones i do agree that starting with the silent era wouldn't really give the best impression of what his films are like even though i was born but it's definitely one of his best films i think probably not going to give you the best indication of what his films are like it's actually quite a, kind of interesting because my very first Ozu film was Good Morning, which, as I mentioned a couple of times, is a comedy. So uh, I was going into that and I sort of didn't know what was going on with all the strange framing I was getting and everything. And I was going back and looking over my original review from 15 years ago and all of it's talking about all this framing and how strange it is and whether it's meant to have a comedic effect or not. So, I mean, that wasn't my entry point. I don't know if it's the best entry point, I guess. I think a nice... Quite might be somewhere maybe in the 40s, you end up getting one of the longer films. Like, Tokyo Story is close to two and a half hours long, which might not be the best entry point. So I'm thinking maybe he did a really great one in the 40s called There Was a Father. And I'd say maybe that might be a nice place to start if anybody wants to start there. Although, once again, it's a film that I haven't seen in 15 years. There Was a Father is a great film, and it actually ties on some similar themes to, to Tokyo Story, but a bit of a reversal as well, so that, that's, a, that's a beautiful choice. I, I would probably say either Tokyo Story or Late Spring. Uh, Tokyo Story is because it, it was also the greatest film of all time by I mean, a huge number of directors, so that already has like the cultural appeal, like this is one of the films that you need to see if you're into cinema. Uh, late spring is high up there too. Obviously, it's shorter. It, it, the camera moves a lot more. It's so I'm not sure if it's a lighter mo- uh, movie. It's it's a more more emotionally heartbreaking movie, perhaps. Don't even dare they compete. But uh, those are 
you know, his two biggest films, I would say it would make sense to start with one of them. I would actually say though that Tokyo Story is probably the more accessible just because the teams aren't as Japanese. If you look at uh, Late Spring, where even there was a father, there's a lot of uh, Japanese culture in there. I mean, in, in there was a father, there's this kind of, the thing that's pulling these two people apart is like this culture of working hard, putting everything into what you're doing, and also this kind of World War II semi-propaganda that's pushed on the family as well, that you just kind of just sacrifice yourself completely. Uh, and that's why, you know, we had this kind of heartbreaking uh, loss of relationship between father and son. But in Tokyo Story, it feels like a little bit more universal. You have this old couple, they come to visit their children, and the children aren't really happy to have them around. I think that's something that everyone, regardless of ages, regardless of culture, can relate to on a much greater point and, and just associates themselves with. So, so yeah, I would probably say uh, Tokyo Story. And of course, if you're really into silent, then I was born, but might actually be a good starting point, even if it doesn't give the best idea of what Osu would go on to do. But let's just go back to the beginning then, or semi-beginning. Uh, let's talk about I Was Born But. Uh, Osu's breakout film, I mean, if you look earlier, he has some great stuff like That Night's Wife, But I Was Born But is the huge film. It's in the sight and sound and TSPDT's uh, top 500 films of all time. It's one of the most renowned films from Japan, from the silent era, from the 30s. And like you mentioned, it is a comedy. So, so, so I know you, you just rewatched I Was Born But the other day. How was it like uh, revisiting uh, that world? And how would you say it's different from late Osu? I Was Born But was definitely an interesting film to revisit because going into it, you sort of have that preconception from seeing as other films that it's going to have all these static shots, it's going to have characters talking directly into the camera, and it's actually not quite like that. There's less static camera work, and there are actually some great tracking shots in there. So there's one where it goes up and down the father's workplace, and then the camera similarly travels up and down the boys' school. So the camera work's a lot more active in there. There's less of the characters speaking directly to the camera. So for me, I guess I found it an easier film to get immersed in because the style was, I guess, similar or not similar. The style was less unlike what I'm into these days. What was interesting for me in particular about rewatching is that I've sort of forgotten that the main chunk of the film, the main crux of the film, occurs in the final half hour. So, I mean, the first hour is mostly just childhood pranks and the kids getting into fights. They've moved into a new area with their dad and they get along with the local boys and they're scared of bullies and running away from them and they're handing in fake work and saying they got good marks at school. But then there's a point around the one hour mark where they sit down with some of their school friends or school bullies or whatever and they watch a film which their father has appeared in and he's all goofy and whatever and they've spent the entire first hour boasting how great their father is and how he's the most important person in the world and then suddenly the world comes crushing down. So the final half hour of the film for me is really strong. I thought both performances of the boys and the father were really great in that final third and you get the whole idea that they decide, you know, I don't know if it's too much of a spoiler or whatever. We can edit it out. They decide they're going to go on a hunger strike unless their dad actually gets a better job. I don't really understand how the world works. I don't understand why their dad's not the boss and why he doesn't appear working for him rather than the other way around. So all that's really interesting. And I guess for the film to be an all-time favorite for me, I'd probably want that to be the main part of the film, like something where you'd spend more than half the film on, rather than something that's just like something that just pops up towards the end. But look. In general, just in terms of rewatching it, it was just incredibly interesting seeing early career Ozu, where he didn't have his style fully in place, where he was a bit more liberal with the camera and liberal with the shot compositions of the way characters talk. And yeah, I just found it yeah incredibly interesting to watch from that point of view. Quite aside from how powerhouse the final half hour is, when it really gets into what the boys feel about their father. And I guess also how the father feels about how the boys perceive him. 
Yeah, that part is, is strong. That used to be my least favorite part of I Was Born, but I, I've seen it, I think, three times now. And I remember the first time I was really disappointed when we got to that section because I had gotten so immersed in this kind of, you know, child's play, the children's world. And that's something, yeah, if, if anyone's listened to uh, sort of our, for instance, uh, Best of the Year podcast, like a lot of the films that we're picking for Best of the Year, such as Summer 1993, those are films that get us immersed in children's world and their way of viewing the world. And the first hour or so is just that. It's these children, they're playing, you kind of get into their head and their mind space. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a really strong thing. And uh, I, I still love that. Though that last section, I think o- over the years, that has grown on me because it, it hits stronger than it did before. I mean, I, I don't know much about Osu's uh, political leanings. Uh, I, I did actually watch uh, The Lady and the Beard uh, for the first time uh, this last week. It, one of Osu's worst, by the way. It's a weird silent comedy. It, 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 he did it before I was born, but it's even less into his style. But then he's, he's actually snuck in a picture of uh, Karl Marx on one of the walls. I don't know. I don't think that also was a kind of secret communist or anything like that. But there is this kind of semi-class critique in this film where the children are asking, like, why aren't you the boss? Why can't you be the big executive? And the father explains, you know, he doesn't have the money to be a big executive. They ask, like, okay, why don't you? Like, why don't you pay your boss? Why aren't you? They just keep going at it. They don't understand it. They don't understand why he has to bow to his boss, talk up to his boss, etc. And it, it's a very heartbreaking moment. It's a very real moment. And it's a very universal uh, moment. So I think that has a, a lot of punch. And I think one thing that makes this film probably more accessible than a lot of the later Osus is that it's about children and their perception of their father. They think their father is the greatest man in the world. They see him being, you know, this complete suck up who's makes faces for his boss, who kind of is a joker around the office, and they lose almost all respect for him, and it's kind of this whole thing come crumbling down. And that is something I think children from around the world and and adults from around the world can just remember and understand. Uh, And just one final thing before I put it back to you, Saul. One thing that I really hung up on the last time I rewatched it is that it actually starts with a title card that says a picture book for adults. And that makes me think that also in part made this film for adults to understand the world of children and how children think. That's a really interesting uh, framing device. And there's just so much going on in this film that I absolutely love. I also noticed that title card when I recently rewatched the film. I, I didn't remember it at all. And yeah, I thought it was incredibly interesting that it's sort of framed that way as I thought it was a very interesting way of looking at it. And yeah, it's sort of like you're getting the kid's point of view. I mean, a lot of Ozu's films, uh, particularly as you go later in his career, I've got the shots from low camera angles or the camera is positioned low down rather than at height level. And there is a lot of low camera angle shots or ones that are just below ca- camera, just below usual eye level. And I was born, but which sort of does work well for the integration into the kids' world. And um, yeah, it is sort of about the kids' world. I mean, totally. I mean, the kids' world is all about fighting pranks, boasting about whose father is best until suddenly you get that wake up call and realize that your father is the office clown. So um, yeah, I guess it does fit in there quite well in that regard. Also, the beginning of the film was also, I guess, again, different from what I remember from 15 years ago. I didn't remember it properly. But you have these wheels getting stuck in mud and trying to get the boys down to get it out. And all the angles with that and all the uh, cinematography there is just completely different to what you associate late career Ozu with. So, yeah, it was definitely a very interesting film to rewatch. And I'm happy that I rewatched it for the podcast. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also this line throughout as well, because even there, the father leaves his children with the with the trucks talking about to kind of visit his uh, boss and suck up to him. So you kind of have this duality throughout where you kind of see the father consistently sucking up. He's a manager at the work. He's trying to become more important. It's this kind of central team. It's, it's a very, I mean, I was born, but it's a comedy, but there's a lot of really real teams here that just go in throughout. There is a bit of a tragic uh, underpinning. Uh, and we're going to talk about this later as well when we get to Good Morning. There's a lot of really serious societal contemplation, if you don't want to say critique, that just seeps into these films. Uh, and that, that is one of the things that makes I Was Born But great for sure. I, I actually disagree with Sol a little bit on the on the framing of things. I would have preferred it if it was 
composed the way of its later films because that's what really appeals to me. Uh, I was born, but feels a little bit more, I'm not going to say visually bland. It's really well made, and, and also his films are very well made, but it doesn't have that cinematic language associated with him. And uh, as a picture book, it would have been nice if it had that, you know, more minimalist, overcomposed uh, style. But when it's not like that, it does make you immerse yourself more into the world of the characters, or at least give that option. So I am torn on that part. I also really wish that we'd get a, a different release with the different musical accompaniment options, because the Criterion version, which is what I watched the last two times I, I saw it, that's just a very generic pi- piano, the kind of comedy piano uh, playing uh, around, like very American style, the same thing you kind of would expect with middle of the road American sound comedy. I would like to see something a bit more specific for I Was Born, but I think that would elevate it uh, even more. Do you think there's a greater similarity between, say, Japanese silent films and American silent films or other countries because because there's no speaking, because there's fewer kind of tools available to distinguish them? Because my memory of watching it is I liked it, but I think it's a lot harder for the, the cultural aspects that, that make me like Ozu to come out when it's a silent film. I think they're a little bit more limited in what they can be on on screen than the later films. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point as well. I mean, I'm not sure if it's because it's silent. I think that uh, silent films from different countries could still feel very, very different uh, just because, uh, like, like you could compare the Soviet films to the American films, for instance. That's a really big difference. The French were doing something different uh, as well. But I think it's partially just because people are getting inspirations from the same place. Uh, and this is interesting. Uh, I think, I don't recall if it were, there were posters in I Was Born, but, but I remember in That Night's Wife, there are posters of American films uh, around the, the, the home. So I think that at this point, also was still very much inspired by American cinema. Uh, so, so uh, I think that that might also play into why uh, the film might feel more Americanized. But yeah, it's definitely interesting. Uh, and, and that might be, be a good point then, to jump into his talkies. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a huge jump here. You know, we might circle back. We already mentioned there was a father from 1942. I would like to shout out the only son as well from 1936. Two of Osu's best talkies before the end of World War II. But let's move to late spring. The second most acclaimed Osu film overall. Uh, what Adam describes as his absolute favorite, the start of the Rico trilogy. And more so than that, I mean, in many ways, this was the start of Osu's focus on marriage, the way he would continue to focus on marriage. I mean, late spring in particular, you see traces of late spring in so many of his later films. And uh, like, there's not that much you need to necessarily know about this uh, trilogy. I think the main thing is that all of these three films stars Asuko Hara. It's uh, his first collaborations with Asuko Hara, and in all of them, she plays an unmarried woman named Noriko, hence the Noriko trilogy. But it's not the same Noriko. Perhaps she represents something similar, which could be interesting to discuss, but while she's placed in somewhat similar predicaments, the outcome in her personality is different. Each of these films also stars is Ryu in fundamentally different roles, but he is the main lead in all of them. He plays her father, her brother, and in the final film, the father of her deceased husband. Uh, and of course, as with any also, there's also a large overlap between the rest of the character gallery. Uh, but Late Spring was the first. It's the film Adam described as his favorite and the film that made Osu jump up to one of his favorite directors. So uh, I-, I would like to just start with you again, Adam. What is it with Late Spring that speaks to you as much as it does? Okay, so it's hard to articulate my point on this, but that wasn't a joke about I was born, but... <laughs> yeah, so I I really like... I like the whole idea of how you have this happy situation, the father and daughter living together, they're both content, they're both happy, neither of them seem to desire any kind of change. And then you have this kind of cultural idea 
obviously it's partly about it being Japanese, it's partly about the film being from the 1940s. But you have this idea which becomes a lot more apparent in many of the later films, that the idea of having an unmarried woman in the family, you know, it seems to be an incredibly negative thing. And one thing that really strikes me, I don't know what Ozu's position is on this, or if he's trying to comment on it, if he's leaving it up to the viewer, but I really feel when I'm watching some of the films that sometimes the motivations of the family are not really about the happiness of the unmarried woman. Um, I think in Late Spring in particular, there's there's an auntie that's involved, and I don't think she's trying to, to make Noriko happy in any way whatsoever. I think she's just ashamed of there being an unmarried woman in the family. I really like the exploration of how society deals with a woman being unmarried, the pressures that are faced by that woman. And I think in the Noriko trilogy and some of the other films, you get to see how the woman approaches it, what she what she does in that situation as an unmarried woman, how the family approach it. For me, sometimes the family are sympathetic, sometimes the family just want the woman married no matter what. I really enjoyed it from that side of things. And I think I also just found the film quite heartbreaking in terms of there's a lot of deception that goes on, particularly towards the end. And it was powerful for me because there is no happy ending. There is no kind of clear cut resolution to everything. And the, the final scene in particular, as I mentioned earlier, the final scene is my favorite scene in any Ozu film and one of my favorite scenes of all time because again without without saying that much and without putting that much on screen you have an incredibly moving moment that just lasts a short period of time and I think that that's a lot more powerful than words would ever be in, in that situation yeah I completely agree I mean this is one of those films that really solidify the quiet heartbreaks that uh, Ozu could create uh, and this idea that People are just forced into becoming submissive to traditional roles. I, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things in the film is that for the first half or so, you see Noriko just being so happy, so carefree. She's joking with everyone. She's, she's just generally a, a really happy human being. And then once this idea of marriage gets introduced, uh, and especially once the idea of the remarriage of a father gets reintroduced, you can just see her entire demeanor change and she barely smiles again. And it's quite heartbreaking. It's very clear. It's just very visually clear how her entire demeanor slowly changes as, you know, essentially she gives in. She doesn't find the arguments to reject the marriage. It's really, really heartbreaking. And especially as you get to watch the scene, it just gets worse and worse and worse, if you will. What about you, Saul? What is it with the late spring that speaks the most to you? So what speaks the most to me, I do actually have to mirror Adam with that. It's definitely the ending. I think that's a very powerful ending. We're, I don't know how much we're out of spoil of it, but it's sort of just this one character, and we're seeing him sitting alone there from a medium to long distance shot. Uh, just incredibly powerful, and then we've got some waves afterwards. So without spoiling it too much, it is definitely one of those endings that stay with you. It was interesting rewatching this one because I actually rewatched it immediately after rewatching Tokyo Story, and I don't know if that clued me in the wrong way or not, but what I was feeling for most of late spring when I was watching this time round is that she actually wasn't happy with looking after the father but she felt obliged to do it and yes i know she's constantly smiling throughout but you sort of get that especially with the character in tokyo story that she's smiling but is she really that happy underneath and i guess i felt a bit of that in like spring that maybe or well, maybe she's not happy maybe she does want to get married and i guess just the whole marriage theme it didn't really do much for me i didn't find it particularly interesting Although I guess it's going to be a critique of the society that supports marriage at any cost, and I, I get that. And I actually went back and looked at my notes from 15 years ago after watching it, and I actually praised the film for it and what a good job it did of you know, basically damning this um, aspect of society that says you need to get married. So 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely the most striking element of the film, I guess, the whole marriage and the views of marriage and these characters who are sort of forced into letting the daughter marry even though she doesn't want, not letting, but sort of like making the daughter enter into a marriage just because it's perceived to be a way to make her happy. Yeah. I guess watching the film, the other thing, and again, this comes on the back of watching an After Tokyo story, so maybe not the most ideal setup, especially because I've watched it out of chronolog- chronological order, but I can't remember exactly. I think Tokyo story is about half an hour longer, but late spring to me felt longer. But that's more to do with the pacing in there. I mean, there's definitely some pacing things going on. Like There's a whole stretch of the film, which is just dedicated them to watching this performance play. So just from my point of view, I guess it didn't feel maybe as brisk to me as Tokyo Story. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. So, look, I don't want to do all the negatives. It was definitely an interesting film to revisit because my memories of it were quite faded. I actually mostly just remembered about the um, uh, Hara character. I didn't actually remember how much the father's character actually was part of the story. So it was really great rewatching it after 15 years and sort of getting that through my head. This is what it's actually about. It's equally about both characters. So it was definitely interesting from that point of view, even though the film didn't totally win me over, or at least didn't win me over as much as it won Adam over. I should say as well that I didn't like Late Spring quite as much on a rewatch as I did the first time I watched it, partly because my expectations were incredibly high. I felt like I, I agree with so that that late spring felt longer than Tokyo Story, but I don't know if that is positive or a negative. I would still put it as a favorite from Ozu. I also I think it's good that we have different interpretations. I mean, for me, I definitely didn't I definitely didn't get the sense that Noriko was unhappy living with her dad, and I would imagine it's difficult to argue that she was happy getting married because, you know, you see she kind of reluctantly, she very reluctantly kind of goes into that. So whether or not she was happy in the first place, I'm not sure, but I think most people would agree she was certainly not happy with the change. And I I personally felt like the father was portrayed, was portrayed very positively in late spring. And I don't, I don't think the parents are always portrayed positively in all those films, but, I came away with a good impression of the dad, and I think, yeah, I I think, um, and I also, again, like we touched upon earlier, I like that we don't see the wedding, we don't see Noriko after she's left. I think it's interesting that it's completely open to interpretation. Maybe she she goes away and she's incredibly happy. So I like that that, all of that is completely, I think you'd lose a lot if you saw what she was like after getting married. Yes. If you saw that she was happy or unhappy, I think that the film would go down a lot for me. I think the fact that we just don't have a clue what's happened to her makes it so much more powerful. I, I absolutely agree. And I think it's also really interesting that Ozu does not even uh, show her husband or her uh, fiancé, or at one point her suitor, uh, because this is all arranged by her aunt. Enrico meets him, possibly a few times, but we never see them interact. We're told afterward by the aunt that Enrico seemed a bit smitten. We don't see that. Is that the aunt's interpretation? Is that what she tells the father to kind of push him to approve of the marriage or get excited? Like, we don't know. We never see how Noriko and the man who will become her husband interact. We don't know their chemistry. We don't know if she smiled at him. We don't know anything there. And this kind of ambiguity is one of the things that I really love about Late Spring. Uh, I, I would actually say on, on Soul Point, Soul's Point, that I actually rewatched Late Spring uh, twice over the last three weeks. Just because the first time I rewatched it, I was a bit exhausted. I didn't engage with it as much as I possibly should have. And like, so I did feel like it was dragging on a little bit early on. When I rewatched it again, that completely changed and I was entranced throughout. And I think what changed for me is that the first time I didn't really, or first time I watched it, I didn't really feel the father daughter connection because it's very subtle. There's all of these tiny smiles between them. There's these little jokes between them. It's just the way they are around each other when they're on the bus. They all the little ways they interact. They 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 are so subtle that if you're not really watching them, uh, you may not really sense the relationship they have. But on uh, my uh, secondary watch, 
that clicked and I really felt that they had a wonderful relationship together. Now her tears towards the end could just be because she's leaving this wonderful relationship for the unknown. It's the death of the family unit, if you will. And that that's really beautiful in itself. You have this moment uh, where, you know, the father and the daughter, they go on a a trip and they say, no, this will be our last trip together because apparently if they if she gets married so they can never go on a trip together anymore uh, because that, apparently that's how Japanese uh, society is she'll only have to travel with her husband or I, I don't know exactly what goes into that but it's this solemnity about it, it it's that part is heartbreaking and I, I read a lot of interpretations of Osus and a lot of them say that marriage is either death or a kind of death and these people are essentially preparing to be away from, even if they meet each other, they're essentially preparing for the death of the current state of things. And that is felt and it's beautiful and it's really, really strong. And I think that's why we don't see the husband as well, because whatever whatever connection there is between the dad and the daughter kind of dies with that marriage. And I think even if they see each other again, we well, obviously they will see each other again. But I think when you see each other again, whatever connection or dynamic was there has gone forever. So regardless of how good the guy might be or bad or whatever, um, I don't, I think we deliberately do not see the husband because, yeah, I don't know. Because. Yeah, it's their story in a way. It's not, it's, it's not about him in the least. Yeah. And, and I think their story is over. And now I, I think the story of the dad and the daughter is over as soon as she gets, as soon as she marries. And whatever story is that comes later when he meets both of them is a completely different story and a completely different situation. So, yeah, I think we don't see him on purpose for that reason. It's kind of the end of late spring. Just one point that I would like to make on the ambiguity or some of the ambiguity over whether or not she is really happy with the dad. I mean, definitely the scenes together, they definitely do seem very well bonded. But on the side scenes when she's talking to, I can't remember if it's her aunt or her school friend because she has a couple of conversations. And one of the conversations, she's just like, oh, you know, you know what my dad's like or whatever. You know, I can't just leave him alone. And I guess that was a conversation that was playing my mind for most of the first part of the film where I was going, you know, well, maybe she feels the dad's too controlling, would be too helpless without her. Maybe she feels that she needs to sort of be there in place of her mother because her mother isn't there to look after the father. So I guess that's what was playing on my mind. But then again, I guess the conversations, at least to me in the way that I approach films, are a bit distracting because you have the one where she's uh, conversing with a friend or whatever. And the way the uh, two shots are uh, edited together with both of them looking at each other, you know, it's like they're dissolved on top of each other because they're both staring into the camera. So possibly I was a bit more distracted by the style to really concentrate on the nuance of the conversations. But with the conversations that she had with the aunt, who, you know, does come off as a bit of an interfering character, to say the least, and the conversation with the uh, divorced school friend, yeah, both of them, I guess, gave me a little bit of an impression that maybe, maybe she didn't want to be married, but maybe she didn't want to be tied down to her father either. Yeah, that part's really interesting. And this is one of the things to also do, that you don't always know if the characters speak the truth. Is, is she, for instance, saying that, you know, her father needs her, and that the reason why she doesn't want to get married is because she just wants to look after him and she's worried about him. Is that the real reason she doesn't want to get married, or is that just the most respectful reason that she can find in, in her head? Because you kind of you kind of have this idea that characters always try to be polite, they always try to speak within conventions, and she, she might just be searching her head for any reason not to get uh, to get married, so I think it's it's really interesting that you know you never really know what's behind people's words in all those films. I think it's also interesting that she is very polite. She might not be saying all her views, but there is one point when she's very strong in her views, and that's when she's talking against remarriage. So she's very strongly against. She's like disgusted by remarriage, and we don't really know why. Does does she not want her dad to get remarried? Does she just object to remarriage in general because it wasn't acceptable at that point? I don't know. But for someone who's so polite and respectful, that's the one time I think when we really hear her having a strong opinion. So I think maybe she has that strong opinion because she doesn't want her dad to get remarried. Or maybe she is just against 
or maybe she's against marriage in general. Maybe she just doesn't like the idea of marriage at all. I don't. I don't know. But I think that's quite a significant moment that for someone who doesn't normally speak her mind that much. She is a bit more. She's a lot more vocal there. Absolutely. I think it's also interesting that, for instance, when her friend batches her to get married, they says, "Oh, you need to try it. I mean, you can always get divorced." And she just runs out of the room essentially she doesn't want to hear about getting married and when she hears about her father's remarriage and she sees you know the woman he's he could marry it's just a complete frown she's it's interesting because there's so many different things you can think about doesn't she want her mother to be replaced is it something else what is that that all about is she jealous like does she just want him all for herself in a way there's just so much going in there there's so many different things to uh, to interpret and there there is another interpretation that's been brought up a lot which is that uh, Noriko in this film in particular might be gay there's some reasoning behind it uh, apparently there has long been suspected that Osu could have been gay apparently he was kicked out of school because he wrote a love letter to a boy and and of course he himself uh, never married and actually this is interesting he lived all his life with his mother. So maybe uh, late spring is like his nightmare scenario where he has to get married and, and leave his parents. <laughs> you, you never know. But it, it, it might, it, there's a lot of people who suggest, especially people who are uh, studying also that you know, these women represent Osu uh, in a way and uh, and his uh, his feelings on the topic. I actually kind of support that the idea that she could have been gay. And I think when she's kind of disgusted by remarriage, my impression is she's kind of disgusted by marriage in general. And I think that interpretation could easily be true. It's something that crossed my mind when I watched the film, when she was so kind of against the idea of leaving, against the idea of being married. Was there not even, was there a bit of dialogue in it where where it's referenced? Did, her, did one of her friends not say something like, I've got a feeling there was one line in it where a friend referenced that but i could be wrong like did someone say do you like men or something i can't remember um i'd have to i'd have to double check that i i, I don't remember that but I, actually in early summer they are wondering if noriko is gay there's this kind of like they're, they're literally ask you straight out yeah maybe that's what is that are we are we summer yeah. or are we early we, summer yeah early summer uh i watched the two of them like right after each other so i think i'm confusing it with that one mm. but i do still support that interpretation in late spring and because of the disgust mm. she had about remarriage or about marriage in general and i know it's a different film but the idea that they were even talking in the 40s or 50s in the japanese film that that line jumped out at me because i didn't expect to see that in a in a japanese film from from that era so i think that also adds more possibility to the idea that maybe Ozu would portray a character who is gay but he just wouldn't wouldn't explicitly say that she was. Yeah, and that was something that was normal in American cinema as well, where you kind of had these teams, like even straight marriages, for instance, would represent a, a gay uh, relationship, etc., just because they couldn't say it due to censorship or due to societal backlash in the classic era. So it, it is a really interesting angle to and, and, and interpretation to see the film in. But, but maybe we can move into early summer then, because that's a very, very different uh, film to me. It, it's a film where, I mean, on the surface, a lot of the same. It's, uh, Suzuko Hara's character is still named Suzuko. She's 28 rather than 27. She, she has a bigger family this time. Uh, she lives with her brother, his wife, and, and her parents. So, so it's not just her and her father, and she's not doesn't seem as connected to her parents. But the main team is... The same. The family decides that she needs to get married and start to look for, for, a, for a suitor. But in this one, Noriko has some thoughts on her own and, and she, she feels like she's less shy and she has a bit more agency. So uh, what was your reactions to early summer, uh, Adam? And like, how do you see it as being different than late, to late spring? So I, I really like early summer, but I definitely much prefer late spring. I think early summer has far more comedy elements. I think there's comedy in a lot of Ozu films, but I think the comedy element was a lot stronger. There was a lot more of the kind of misunderstandings, you know, typical kind of humour you might see in these films. I think it was quite nice watching early summer after late spring because I liked I liked it now we see we see a, a version of Noriko who 
goes against what her family wants. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit of a palace scene too. Yeah, it was. I think it was needed. I, it's quite nice after the heartbreak of late spring. It's quite nice following that up with early summer and seeing a different scenario where it's a different Noriko, but you know the themes are similar. So I think seeing a Noriko who makes her own decision was very important. I think the reason I prefer late spring. I mean, there's two reasons I prefer late spring. The first is whilst I like the comedy, I think having more comedy in it. Makes me like the film less, but also, I think the heartbreak in late spring was so powerful that that elevated the film massively to for me. Whereas in I think early summer is a bit. I think it works very really well in contrast to late spring with her making her decisions. Um, I I think when we when I spoke to Chris before, I think Chris felt more moved by the heartbreak of the parents, whereas. For me watching it, I, I didn't really care. About, there's a scene at the end where uh, the parents see a young a young woman getting married and, you know, they're obviously kind of heartbroken. But I personally didn't care that much about the parents. I cared more about Noriko. So I didn't find the sense of heartbreak in early summer anywhere near as moving as late spring because my focus on both of those films was very much to the Noriko character, how she made decisions or didn't make decisions. Whereas, and, and again, in late spring, I was very moved by the portrayal of the dad. In early summer, I didn't find the parents moving at all. I found the whole thing was about here is a Noriko in contrast to the, to the earlier Noriko who is independent, who's making her own decisions. So yeah, that's a long way of basically saying the heartbreak in late spring and the more serious kind of drama of late spring made me prefer it. But I think Early Summer is a very worthy film. It's a very interesting film, particularly, I think it's a good one to view after late spring as a pretty significant contrast in the, the actions of the characters. But I also think there's still a lot of similarities. You know, there's still things that we don't get to see. It still ends in heartbreak. I just think it's a bit better. It's a bit of a later film and a bit more of a comedy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things I didn't mention when we talked about Light Spring is that the camera moves so much in Light Spring. Uh, like, it, it moves on the Rico bicycles, it, it, it pans lots of places, uh, it, it follows the ocean line. There's a lot of movement. We follow them when they walk in early summer. It, it, you feel like also has already started to establish uh, his style a bit more. But the biggest difference is the comedy and the agency. And I, I think the forest in early summer really comes from the fact that, unlike in late spring, they don't tell Noriko she's getting married. They kind of hint at it. They say that, you know, they have this suitor for her, but then they never tell her again. They start arranging everything. They start doing background checks. They start sneaking around, scheming. They get people to kind of speak to her, to kind of hint around, to see how she feels about the man they picked, with her brother hiding behind the, the uh, literal door. You know, every time Noriko leaves, he opens it and gives instructions to his wife to kind of like uh, maneuver the conversation in specific ways and he closes it again to not be noticed. Like, it, it, there's a lot of parse here. And I think that's probably the reason why the heartbreak isn't felt as strongly. Her brother, this time pl- also played by Christian Ryu, like he's the male lead in the film, he's not that likable. He's just kind of this forceful brother who thinks that she really just has to get married and just kind of pushes her away because it's the thing to do, that he kind of forces everything uh, around them. It's just such a contrast, and your emotions aren't really with him at all. And then you have these parents who kind of just... Like, it feels like the brother has supplanted the father and the mother in, in this relationship, like he's the authority of the house, and the parents are kind of more complacent. I did feel for them in this film, like Adam mentioned. Like I feel like they're kind of like on the sidelines. They're walking around. They're talking about how happy they are to still have Noriko in their lives. How everything will change when she gets married, and how they should just not be greedy. Like allow their children to move away, not expect too much. Uh, like this is the film before Tokyo Story. And you can kind of sense that also might have gotten the idea for a couple in Tokyo Story from these people. Uh, it's even the same woman portraying the mother. Uh, there is heartbreak in this how they're kind of abandoned at the end and their children kind of uh, like brushes them aside. But the focus in the film is on Noriko. This time you actually see the person that she's going to, to marry. Not the suitor. The suitor is actually, interestingly, just left off screen again. But the person she kind of chooses. And it, it just changes the dynamics completely. And Noriko 
makes her own choice. She's actually able to make her own choice. The family actually objects, and she stands up to them. So uh, it's just a completely different Noriko. And I, I think Early Summer is a great film, but it doesn't have the heartbreak, and that does actually put it below Late Spring for me as well. I just wanted to add a couple of points based on what you just said. So I think there's a couple of things. So in, in Late Spring, I mean, I, I despised the ant. Like, I absolutely hated the ant in Late Spring. In early summer, I didn't have a strong opinion against the parents. I think in early summer, the parents are a lot more sympathetic than, than the ant was in, in late spring. And I also think the heartbreak gets reduced significantly because it's the ant that's driving the marriage in late spring, who's sort of putting the ideas into the dad's head, almost like manipulating him into doing this stuff. And it turns in this, into this deception. Early summer, I think, is a lot more straightforward. Any kind of heartbreak is sort of that she went against their wishes. No, I'm not very sure if they're going against their wishes. I think they're worried about her happiness in a different way than happiness really works. Yeah. Like, the mother cries because she's most likely picking a poorer man, uh, and she just thinks that, you know, happiness is, you know, a, a large house, uh, protection, and she just thinks she's making... Like, there's this idea in these films that love matches... Uh, like the like social idea that love matches are lesser than arranged marriages, uh, and that you know this love disappears, uh, then you're gonna be less miserable. But if you arrange it properly, you're gonna be happy. Like even if it takes a long time, so it's it's a very different way the older generation looks at marriage. But I also think a big part of the heartbreak was that she's moving away, and you get the sense it won't she won't come back for many years if she ever comes back. So I think the heartbreak angle is more she's she's going away to the countryside or she's she's going to be far away. They might not see her a lot. So I think there is still some sense of heartbreak, but it's just a very different feeling from the powerful one in Late Spring. Yeah, exactly. And, and like you said, it's not with, like, in Late Spring, the core characters is this daughter and this father. They have a bond. You care about both of them. Both of them are heartbroken. In early summer, it's really just the parents. So we haven't even focused that much on where kind of just left abandoned but, and like tossed away. But the away. thing is, the parents, you say, the, I mean, the parents are, are sort of left abandoned, but they they were also driving, like, the parents were desperate for Noriko to get married. So it's a lot harder for me to watch that film and feel devastated for the parents when they got what they wanted. It's just mm. that what they wanted was, the outcome was a bit different. But it wasn't... Yeah. I, I also mm. think, one. I mean, the comedy part is one of the strengths of Early Summer. It's just at the same time, <laughs> I enjoy the comedy. It's just, it just makes the film have a different tone and a different vibe to it. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I just find it very difficult to sympathise that much with the parents. I mean, again, it came after Late Spring, and I see them as different Noriko's, but I'm also watching the film cheering on Noriko when <laughs> yeah, she makes yeah. her own decision. And that, that kind of blinds me a lot to any sense of heartbreak that the parents are feeling. But the parents wanted her to get married. She got married. You know, it's like... <laughs> Your fault. I, I just think the heart is that she's she's not staying in the same city as them. Like, she's not staying in Tokyo. She's not... Yeah, there might be the whole poverty angle. But I think they, they wanted her to get married on her their terms. And what I like is that they actually do accept her decision so i i actually i didn't have a problem with the parents i i almost like the parents a, a little bit it's just i think it's just a bit it's less powerful than late spring but it's still a very interesting dynamic and, and i like the comedy elements i just prefer the strong kind of drama and heartbreak in late spring yeah, exactly. And uh, I think early summer also is like, it's a dramedy. It's in the middle between late spring and Tokyo Story, which are two films that really just felt a bit so heartbreaking. So l let's move on to uh, Tokyo Story, which kind of picks up in a similar place to where the parents in early summer are left off. So you have this older couple, they're living far away from Tokyo, they rarely see their children, they still have a live-in daughter, but uh, the majority of their children have moved away. They live in Tokyo and they're going to take this long trip to finally reconnect with them. And when they get there, it's pretty clear that the children, like, are, are they happy to see them at all? Like, like you, you have the scene where they talk about, like, what food they're going to give them and the, the wife of the son wants to do something slightly more extravagant and the husband kind of shuts her down and says, this will be enough for them. 
you kind of have these annoyance that they're there from both the son and the daughter, uh, and they kind of just put on the sidelines. The only person who actually seems to care for them and, and to be happy to see them is the wife of their deceased son, who of course is Noriko, once again played by Suzuki Hara, and it's a powerful film, like you mentioned. This is a film that's considered the best film of all time by qu- quite a lot of people. It's one of the most important films of all time. So I would just love to hear both of your uh, perspectives on Tokyo Story. And since it's your favorite, so it would be very good to hear from you first. Like, what is it with Tokyo Story that connects with you so much? I suppose what I particularly like about Tokyo Story is it's got more to it than the basics that we tend to expect from an Ozu film. I mean, at least what I tend to expect from an Ozu film was you have these awkward conversations where you've got characters who are looking directly into the camera rather than looking at each other, got a lot of static, static camera work, and Tokyo Story doesn't quite do that. There's lots of exterior shots in there also about the hustle and bustle of the city. We see the power lines everywhere. There's actually a really great trucking shot, which moves just ever so slightly. A trucking shot that just moves ever so slightly to see the father and, or the grandfather and the grandmother when they're having a little bit of a picnic outside. So for me, it actually feels a lot more alive than most of Ozu's films do. And of course, there's lots of framing in there, but there's all these very famous shots of the grandmother and the grandfather sitting with their backs to the camera overlooking the sea or just sitting outside and looking out. And uh, I just find the framing uh, very, very interesting, more so than usual in Ozu film. But I guess probably um, Chishu Ryo, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the lead actor, and just his performance in there just really um, makes the film for me. You know, I just feel for his character in there and how much emotion he has inside and how little he actually lets bubble up to the surface. I mean, I did say that on rewatch, it did drop for me a little bit, and I guess I do find it very literal. I mean, same thing with Late Spring Water. Lots of characters speak in their mind, saying things out loud that we could observe without them having to say it out loud. But again, a lot of it comes in more, I guess, natural ways in Tokyo Story. I mean, one of the best scenes has the uh, father getting drunk with a couple of other men or whatever, and when they get drunk, they start to then talk about children and what people are like in modern society, having no time for parents and whatever. So for me, that part's quite natural, as some of the other conversations are quite as natural. Uh, I guess to me it's a harder film for me to relate to thematically. I mean, I was getting into the uh, chat about this with Adam before. I mean, yes, I've got parents, but I've never been in that situation of being too busy to see them. And I don't have children, let alone adult children, so I can't hear it from that point of view. I do feel that it's a film that maybe... I read it down the track. If I had kids and if they grew up, maybe I'd be able to relate to it a bit more. But I did find it, yeah, not quite as interesting as upon rewatch as I did the first time round. But like I said before, I was expecting that. I do think it is incredibly well done. I do think it's probably Ozu's best looking film, even though the camera work isn't quite as mobile as in I Was Born But. And you have the great colors of something like Good Morning. It is still incredibly good looking. It's a very well acted film, uh, even though I wouldn't say it's one of the uh, 10 or 20 or even 30 or 40 best films of all time. Yeah, it's funny how different our perspectives are on the camera work because to me, like the more also just narrows his sight there onto what he wants, the more I, I, I love the style. And here, like you said, the camera only moves, I think, twice. And uh, the rest of it is as beautifully composed as any of his uh, later films. And the heartbreak is really, really strong in this one because you just feel the parents just keep being pushed aside. But being also, like, I don't really think there are any bad characters per se. Like, you still understand why the children are busy. You still understand that they, you know, they have their own lives and you can see why. Uh, having this couple on top makes it more difficult for them, even though your sympathy throughout is with these parents. Uh, wh- what about uh, you, Adam? Uh, what is it with Tokyo Story that affects you so much? I mean, first of all, sorry, so when I when I said you can relate to it because you have parents, that was, uh, was actually a bit of a stupid point because I can't relate to it either. I can't relate to the idea of parents visiting and me not wanting to see them. But... 
I think it's interesting to think about what the childhood was like for the sons and daughters. And there, to me, there's like slight hints that maybe, well, maybe the dad wasn't a great dad. We know he used to drink. He stopped drinking, I think, when one of the kids was born. But we don't really know what the childhood was like because there's a lot of negativity towards the dad. I mean, at one point, one of the one of the children says that they wished the dad had died first so they could have taken the mum in. So I personally felt that it went further than simply saying children get older and don't care about their parents as much. To me, there were hints of maybe they didn't have a great relationship in the first place. I get the idea of maybe, I mean, I don't, I don't relate to it, just like Soul doesn't, but I get the idea of, I get the idea of maybe getting, of the children getting older and forgetting about their parents, but I don't think they would get older and then treat the parents quite so negative where you talk about who they wish would die first. I mean, even as soon as the mum dies, you know, they're talking about who gets her possessions and stuff. So I think there's something maybe deeper about it. That maybe, maybe they didn't have an amazing family connection growing up. And maybe, maybe the parents that you see in Tokyo Story aren't quite the same as the parents that the children know from their childhood. I mean, the film went up for me on a rewatch. I think it's a more accessible film. I, th- I think it's a little bit more conventional in the way it's got a story. I think it's a bit more of a linear story than things like Late Spring. And I also thought the Noriko character was very powerful. And for me, again, the Noriko character was almost the centre of the film. I also I found it an interesting angle that in this one, the parents, I know they're not Noriko's parents, but the, the parents in this one, they want Noriko to get remarried. And it seems like they want Noriko to get remarried for like selfless reasons. They want her to be happy. That's all they care about. And it's it's just interesting to see the the one the character they have the strongest connection with is mm. the one that's not actually related to them. You also get hints that the son the son who died, who was married to Noriko, the son isn't they don't talk positively about him at all either. So to me it's like a kinda on the surface, here's like here's how you act like a happy family, like here's how we go and visit our kids, everything's great. But deep down, when when the dad's talking to his friends, they start talking about family, all the difficulties with children. Um, when they talk about the son that died, here's all the problems with him. The dad used to be an alcoholic. I see it more as this is how we portray a happy family when deep down there's actually issues. And that that's something that I could relate to in terms of like one or two things when I was growing up where everyone sort of acts like everyone's happy and then actually there probably are more issues that we're not aware of so i i've i maybe interpret the film a little bit differently than so or in term, than some people would i mean i think it's just a great film in terms of storytelling but i think there's an awful lot of interpretations to it and i don't think it's as straightforward as here's these horrible kids who the kids did come across badly but we don't know why they feel so negatively especially one of the daughters we don't know why she feels so negatively about her dad I don't think it's as simple as kids grow up and forget their parents. I think it goes deeper than that. And yeah, so I actually liked the film a lot more the second time I watched it. Um, and I think I liked it more because I, when I first watched it, that was the first Ozu I'd ever seen. And I think I appreciated it more having become a big fan of Ozu to watch his biggest kind of most acclaimed film again. Yeah, I think you're completely right on the character motivation. So there wasn't necessarily that unhappy home. And, and you can hear the daughter also being very upset about how the father used to greet the mother and all his drinking, etc. And of course, you have that moment when he comes back home drunk to her again as well. So it's there, there's a lot of things under the surface. You might say it's about the politeness and the smiles when everything is just not okay at all. And uh, yes, it, I think it, it, with the Noriko relationship, I think it's also interesting that they never tried to arrange a marriage for her. They essentially just tell her that, you know, don't feel compelled to stay a widow. You know, if you want to, you can get married. So this is like completely different from previous films. They're just giving all of the agency to Noriko. So that is a very beautiful sentiment. I mean, and I also think Tokyo Story is more universal because the children are going older and maybe not connecting with their parents as much anymore. I think that has a far greater universal appeal to it. And that may be why the film is so popular. Whereas the other ones in the later era are a little bit more tied to the culture of the time. I think Tokyo Story is probably a little bit more timeless and a little bit more relatable. Maybe not in the sense of you have to have forgotten about your parents, but it's probably more relatable in general than some of the other films. It just depends on your interpretation, though, really. Yeah, it's very true. I think my, the only real negative I would say about Tokyo Story is that you have that scene towards the end when 
I, this is a conversation between uh, Noriko and uh, her sister-in-law, the youngest one who still lives with her parents, and the sister-in-law kind of spells out how she's feeling about her siblings and how cold they were, and kind of says what a lot of the audience has been thinking. And I think that wasn't necessary, but beyond that, I think just Tokyo Story is just one of the best films ever made. And honestly, if you put Tokyo Story next to the other regular candidates, so Vertigo, Citizen Kane, et, et cetera, I, I would probably put Tokyo Story above them, uh, even though I wouldn't put it in my own top 10. I think that's a very good point you made about the daughter spelling everything out. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you didn't like that because it kind of goes in contrast to everything we're saying about why we love Ozu, which is a lot of the most important things are left unsaid. Yes, uh, exactly. But to brighten up the conversation a, a little bit and move into something that Saul likes about Ozu, let's just quickly jump on to uh, Good Morning, <laughs> back to Ozu comedy, gold, and also a bit of societal critique. It's sometimes called a remake of I Was Born, but... Uh, but the only thing that seems to be similar is that the children at one point have a problem with the father and they start a protest. Everything else seems completely different. So, Saul, uh, what is it with the comedy and the, like the, the bright colors, etc., about uh, Good Morning that works more for you? Good Morning is a film that I guess I have a lot of goodwill to, a uh, bit of a pun intended there. A lot of goodwill towards because it was my very first Ozu film. But stylistically, it actually resembles, really, very, really much resembles the work of a director I really like, who Adam really hates. So I'm um, interested to see what he makes of when Adam does actually watch it. But for me, I think it's the closest that Ozu has come to making a Jacques Tati film. And it is a v- very Tati like. Oh, it is. So definitely. You've got lots of. Uh, depth of film manipulation. You've got some comedy where you've got characters who are sort of walking on top of a hill and it looks like it's like a green wall because of the way it's shot. And you've got characters who are walking underneath at the same time. So there's quite a bit of comedy in there. The music score is actually very similar. But I guess for me, again, like the other Ozu films, it was a mild disappointment for me because like I was born, but for me, the crux of the film actually lies in what happens towards the end or in the second half of the film, that the kids decide to have a vow of silence, and they, they're not going to talk unless their parents buy a television set. And just all the scenes of the brothers communicating, and like the younger brother's got this little like, okay sign, that if he puts it up there, he's allowed to talk or whatever, he's trying to talk in class, and uh, he's putting a sign up, but the teacher has no idea what it means, that she thinks he needs to go to the bathroom. I mean, all of that for me was really amusing, but it's also got that same idea, as in uh, I was born, but you've got these kids who don't really understand how the world works. So like, like the brothers in the earlier film, who don't understand that dad can't just be the boss. You've got these boys who don't understand why their parents just don't go out and buy a television set. Uh, but I thought that was all kind of interesting. And look, there's other little bits of funny parts in there also. You've got a neighbor who manages to uh, scam a free pencil out of this guy who's going around door to door trying to sell pencils and she manages to scam a free one out of him. So there's lots of amusing things in there. And I guess for me, uh, probably the key thing is um, Ozu is what I define as a very weird framing. We've got these characters looking directly into the camera. For me, that works a bit better in a comedy. I mean, I, I've said it before with Light Spring and Toy Girl Story, it was a little bit distracting for me. It felt a little bit more at home in Good Morning that you've got these characters who are looking directly into the camera rather than actually looking at each other, especially because there's lots of communication also as the key theme in the film. So I rewatched five Ozu films in preparation for this, and I would definitely say Good Morning was my least favourite, and it went down a little bit on a rewatch. I still liked it, but... It was just too much like Tati, wasn't it? <laughs> well, when I watched it, it actually crossed my mind that there were elements of the film that were like that were like European comedies that I... Uh, basically, I have a bit of a reputation for hating European <laughs> comedies, with good, with good reason. You know, hopefully next year we'll do a podcast on them. Um, if I can survive watching more of those films. So I did feel when watching it, there was a a few things where I I was like, hey, this reminds me a little bit of these European comedies that I I hate. 
the constant kind of fart jokes. Yeah, that I could have done without that whole. I mean, I'd rather that whole that whole thing was out of it. I liked some of the interactions between the children. I liked the sort of childhood element of it. I if that if that had been a little bit stronger, I think I would have liked it. You know, I, I liked when they were like speaking in English in response. You know, the 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 little boys weaving saying "I love you," and there were things that I found quite quite likable, quite sweet, and there were some comedy elements. So, I mean, for me, I would say it's like a European comedy elevated by the style of Ozu and having some of the things I like in it. But a lot of the comedy didn't go well, didn't sit right with me. And there was enough kind of of Ozu's traits for me to like the film. But there was also enough annoying comedy to not make it a favourite. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it, I actually thought it was great this time. Uh, it, this used to be one of my least favorite also, just because of the fart jokes, <laughs> in part. I, I really like the social critique. I like the fact that, you know, the children literally just straight up ask, like, why all this politeness? Why all this courtesy? Why all these filler words? You're not saying anything. That is such a powerful uh, thing in this also film. I think it uses children the same way in I Was Born, but to explore some tough social themes. Here, just the fact that all of society, all of Japanese society can be so uh, almost emotionless or careful or over polite that they only really speak in uh, politeness, in these phrases. But then you also have this beautiful scene at the end where you kind of have this romance blossoming from this kind of empty small talk. So it, it, it's it's a nice balance. And uh, it leaves you with a lot to think about. And of course, the colors are great. It's beautiful to see also in color photography. This is something that he brought with him and just elevated as his career progressed. And that's probably a good segue to his very last film, An Autumn Afternoon, which seems to spin a little bit on the late spring narrative. You have a father, he's thinking of marrying off uh, his daughter, there are many other overlaps, and just the styles, the, the beauty of the colors, so well composed. It might be one of Ozu's most perfected films visually. Just absolutely stunning. Th- there's a lot of things that are very different with this one, and like I said, it's also his very last film. He almost feels like he knows he's going to die. It feels like a final film in many ways. Uh, what is the most striking thing about Not an Afternoon to you, Adam? I mean, I I was reading that he was planning another film, but I do agree with you that it felt like a farewell. I was struck by the colors. It was you know all the ones I rewatched were were black and white. Apart from Good Morning, okay, delete that. But all, all the all the more dramatic ones I watched were black and white, and the visuals certainly stood out. Well, I, I think another thing that's different about it is that it plays in with the comedy again too, which a lot of the later also do. They play up the comedy, but in a different way from Early Summer. The comedy doesn't really cut away from the social uh, critique the same way. It it might just be the color in fact is brighter, etc. But the edges come out in a different way. And it, it, it's, I just really love the way also plays with this kind of comedy in his late films. I really like the comedy elements in this one. So the thing about me with Oz- Ozu is I didn't like Good Morning so much, I think, because it was much more of a kind of comedy overall. But I do really like his dramas that have comedy elements. You know, I like this sort of like banter be- between the old guys. You know, they'd, they'd meet up and they'd be sort of like laughing at each other about one of them has a wife who's like very young and like they're pretending like at one point they pretend the guys died when he you know i like the humor between the characters yeah definitely. i think the references to the war were really powerful as well so you know they're, they're singing like the song from the war and i think there's a bit of a negative an anti kind of war almost an anti-war type feeling to it i mean there were a lot of really powerful messages uh within the film as well the whole idea of loneliness again and i think i think the ending of the film was perfect for the end of ozu in general i and i think a lot of those other films explore loneliness and explore people's emotions and feelings i think they explore a lot of things that people don't say so i think also having films where people don't say specific things i think there's a lot of sense of like there's just a lot of like messages or conversations about what life is about and what what it means to the characters and all the struggles the characters face. 
and there's an overriding sort of sense of loneliness and it, it's, it ends on a slightly negative note, I guess, for Ozu, but I think it's a perfect sort of, it's like a sort of summary of his career and a little bit of a goodbye, even if it wasn't intended to be that. I, I thought, it, I mean, it went up in my estimation on a rewatch. I just... Oh, mine too. Absolutely. I just thought, like, I loved the interactions between the characters. I loved... I, I think he got his spot on, you know, there's a bit of comedy, a bit of drama, a bit of, a bit of emotion and heartbreak. It was a mix of everything that I kind of like about the other films in some ways, as, as a kind of goodbye to Ozu. Yeah, it's very true. It's, it plays a little bit of uh, like a best off as well. I think it's just so, like, like you mentioned earlier, you, you actually have the same ending, more or less, as in Late Spring. And the relationship between the father and daughter is... is you, you're kind of wondering, is this going to be a late spring or early summer? Is she going to have more agency because she kind of has this suitor she's looking at, or is she not? And I think this one, too, actually ends with the powerful punch in the gut. I don't think it hits as strong as late spring, simply because you don't see the daughter as much. It's not as integral part of the film. You have comedy with his father and his friends. You have, you know, the, his older son, his wife, who keeps getting into, like, semi-hijinks and uh, bickering matches, etc., uh, so that part seems a little bit more on this side, but the heartbreak is still there, the critique is still there, and this idea that it is Osu's last film, it feels, while well, the comedy is there, it feels heavier in a way, and it leaves on such a somber note that it, it just encapsulates Osu so beautifully. Yeah, and I think the heartbreak is different from the other films, but it's it's still quite meaningful, because it's a really genuine heartbreak where the daughter, you know, liked the guy, the guy liked the daughter, but because of certain factors, they never end up together. I think it was slightly unusual and there's a bit where um, someone says they saw the daughter crying. I think that's another element that might not have been in the earlier films in terms of explicitly saying what was happening. But I thought it was heartbreak and comedy and I think they combined them in a really in a really strong way. The heartbreak wasn't as strong as Late Spring. The The comedy wasn't as strong as Good Morning. But it worked well. And I just, and I like, I, I, again, I, I think the interactions between the dad and his friends was a really nice thing that felt different from the other films yeah. I rewatched. And it was really nice to sort of see their humour. And I think the humour, you know, the humour came from their interactions rather than sort of Good Morning, where it's a little bit more explicit mm -hmm. comedy throughout. It was more, it felt a bit more real, everyday kind of conversations that you might get between a group of friends. And that's why it worked better for me. And the heartbreak wasn't strong enough for me to sort of be moved incredibly by it, but it was enough for it to elevate the film as well. So it had a really nice blend. I mean, you're probably going to ask this anyway, but it's sad watching the film and you think, wow, you know, look at the run of films he's, this, this director has had in the last few years of his life. What could we have had for another 10, 20 years? Yeah, exactly. The fact that it's his final film adds quite a lot of meaning to it. And you're thinking, this is the last thing we ever get from this director who's had an incredible run of like 10 or 12 films. Yeah, I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, all like it's from late spring to this film, they, they mirror each other in so many ways. It, it's a beautiful finish to just one of the best roles in, I would say, cinema history. And the, the, this mix of everything he does well, the conversations, the relationships, the beauty of the color and the fact that he just has that style I would say perfectly at this point. It's it, it's just a beautiful farewell gift from Osu, and it's uh, one of those films that lingers on the mind. I also I see it like a gift as well, actually, and that I think that adds a lot to the film. And it, you feel quite lucky that we got this last film that maybe we never would have got. That's so true, and I hope you listeners out there you feel like this uh, episode was a bit of a gift to you as well that you have uh, enjoyed our casual conversations and that. Uh, you will keep returning and listening again. So uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone, and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. We recorded an Azu episode, but...